And joining me today to discuss in length about diabetes is Marjorie Hunter. Marjorie, thanks for welcoming us into your home here in El Lago. November is Diabetes Awareness Month, so what would you like people to know? I have been dealing with diabetes for 51 years now, and I started out as a type 1 diabetic, and uh, I developed many of the complications from type 1 diabetes within the first 16 years. In a very short period of time, six months, I lost my eyesight, I had a heart attack, and I lost my kidneys. At how old? I was 29 at the time. Wow. It's a devastating disease. Yeah. And um, I was fortunate enough to get a kidney transplant from my brother and then a follow-up of a piece of his pancreas. So I became, I no longer was diabetic, but I was on all the immune suppressants and dealt with that. Um, and I no longer had a heart attack, but I did have continuing follow-up heart issues and loss of sensation in my nerves and such. Um, as I continued on, um, I am now 37 years out from a pancreas transplant and I am developing type 2 diabetes. So uh, this involves a whole other level of care. I think I want people to know that diabetes is not cured simply by changing diet and exercise, that it takes a constant um, monitoring and involvement. But if you're diabetic, you can do anything. You can live a full and rich life. And I did, I worked full time, I had a family, I had a son after my transplants. Um, um, tragically, I lost him to type one diabetes a couple months ago, but um, for 15 years, he was a hero. He woke up every morning, he was diabetic, you don't get a vacation from it, he took mm -hmm. care of himself and he thrived. He became an elite sailor. He had hundreds of friends and traveled throughout the world with his particular profession and activities. So he, reached, he lived a rich life. He died at age 25, but he was a hero in my eyes because every day he got up and took care of himself. And one tragic mistake and diabetes took him away. It's, a, it's not solved. It's, but there have been incredible advances. And for those of us with type two diabetes now, um, great efforts have been made to make more treatments available, to make more medications available, more is known about diet. Um, you know, it's not simply not choosing to eat a piece of cake or, or have yeah. a candy bar. It's a little bit more complicated, but, um, but if you eat a healthy diet, a low carb diet, which is so easy now, and um, there are so many foods that are available for that. You can live a healthy life. You can do whatever you want. There, there are no limitations. Yeah. Diabetes is not a limiting thing, but it is something that you have to be keenly aware of. You can't slip. Yeah. Which is so hard for so many people who really take their daily life for granted. You know, I mean, to think about being in your shoes would be really, it's, it is a challenging lifestyle that you have to do. Cause like you said, you don't get a vacation from this. Um, right. But you know what else is that people tend to think that diabetes isn't that serious of a disease because I think because type two diabetes is so prevalent now, like everybody knows somebody with type two oh. diabetes. So they assume that it must be easy. Um, but it's a, it's a really serious illness, like you were mentioning with, with your son. His name was Troy, right? Uh, his name was Hunter. Hunter. He, he took my last name I'm like, I'm confused. Name his your name. name's Hunter. <laughs> yeah, his name was Sorry. Hunter Skinner. He okay. took my husband's last name, Skinner. Sorry, I made that, that mistake. That's okay. Um, a lot of but, people do. So, I mean, so you can... You can I mean, it's a really, I'm just trying to say that it's, it's still a very yeah. serious disease, even it though is. people think that because it's common that it's probably not that, no. that it couldn't be deadly, but it is. It can be. It can be. And, um, and it can be crippling in so many ways. You hear about diabetes being um, the largest 
cause of heart attacks and mm -hmm. heart disease in the U.S. You hear about people who have had to have amputations, who have lost their eyesight like I have, who, um, who struggle with nerve damage in their hands and feet and, and have trouble walking or doing daily tasks. It, it can be extremely debilitating, type 2 as well as type 1. And, um, and it's not a simple thing, but as you take care of yourself, as you, as you learn to use the tools that are available out there, they free you up to do more. It's not a drag, it's, it's something that you do that helps you to do the things you really want to do in life, right? To enjoy your family, to go out and and see things, you know, simple, simple pleasures like going to an art museum or going to the beach or things like that where um, loss of vision or loss of ability to walk or, or issues with your um, kidneys or things like that that can happen from diabetes very mm -hmm. easily, they limit you. So um, taking good care of yourself. Um, it's for your own benefit. It's not because other people are telling you what to do. It's, it's for your own benefit. It's a tool yeah. to an end. What does your daily life look like? Like what kinds of medications and monitoring do you have to do throughout the day? Well, I have um, very many long-term complications from both diabetes and being a transplant recipient. So currently I'm on 14 prescriptions. Uh, I take... Um, 28 pills twice a day. Um, I oh, have wow. a glucose monitor that mm -hmm. I wear right here on my arm and I track my blood sugar on my phone uh, so that if if I need to adjust medications or take an insulin shot now and then I can do that. Um, What's the challenge things. with now having type 2 and type 1 at the same time? Like does that change things for you? It does. Most of my type 1 is handled by the pancreas transplant at this point. But I still, I have the potential complications of um, ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia, low, either high blood sugars or low blood sugars. And so I still need to watch what I eat and how much activity I have and, and adjust um, either my diet or my um, medications to handle those issues. Mm -hmm. Well, so going forward, like, um, what do you, what do you expect? To, what do you, what do you think is going to happen with your future with diabetes? I have prayed for so long for a cure. And so, um, when I first became diabetic in the, in the uh, 70s, I thought 20 years and we should have a cure. Mm -hmm. Well, 20 years came and passed. Um, when my son was born 25 years ago, I thought surely in his lifetime there's going to be a cure and that didn't happen. And um, so I, I see progression. Um, and rapid progression, things are developing new drugs, new treatments, new devices all the time. Um, maybe there will be a chance that at some point in time I can wear a device that will take care of the blood sugars and I won't have to worry about it. I still worry about my eyesight potentially going totally or... Um, or more long-term complications that I haven't faced, or more heart problems, another heart attack. But I do have confidence that with, with enough attention and people paying attention and people contributing and continue, continuing to donate to, to, um, to research, I do think there's going to be a cure, and I think it's going to be easier for people in the future, and it's not going to be a lifetime uh, sentence, <laughs> um, oh. or something that you have to think of every day before you even get out of bed. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. That's what I pray for. Um, I've been benefit 
I've had the benefit of many miracles. I think God's been really good to me. I think medicine has advanced at a good pace for me to keep me alive and active and, and uh, vital, but um, not everybody's had all my privileges. Um, so I'm hopeful that we continue to expand availability of resources, healthcare resources to people from all different walks of life and, and um, all different economic situations. The tremendous um, benefit in reducing the cost of insulin and making it more yes. available now for people has been huge. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see those things continue. I, I'd like to contribute to making that happen. Yeah. And so other people don't, don't experience the loss that I did with my son. I, I pray that doesn't happen. I'm so sorry for, for your loss. That was, I mean, with everything that you've gone through with diabetes, it just, t saying that it feels unfair isn't even, you know, an accurate statement to express just how, you know, the gravity of the situation. I'm really sorry. Thank you. And you do put an interesting perspective on it that, yeah, I mean, there's been such great improvements and the technology, um, but it just, Nothing happened fast enough. Right. Nothing's happened quick enough to save his life and to help you have a better quality of life. Right. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Are you hoping most for a cure for diabetes? Yes, I am. And, and the earliest cures may come in terms of devices to treat, so treatments for diabetes, but I do hope ultimately for cures, whether they're genetic modifications or probably most likely genetic modifications or some sort of um, individually designed medical protocols that can help people manage their diabetes. That's what I pray for. Mm -hmm. I, I am hopeful that will happen. Especially for young people. It's always hard for young people to oh, stay on top of things like that, you know, so. Yeah. It's heartbreaking for for a child to have to deal with diabetes. It's heartbreaking for their parents, and they live in constant fear um, for their child. Yeah. I know I, I've interviewed a mom once before who had twin daughters who both had type 1, and, and, I mean, she just never slept. You know, she was always up in the middle of the night checking numbers and things like that. Is that something that you can relate to? Yeah, less so for my son because he, he did have monitors, but I do, um, I know for the little ones especially, it's so hard for them. and um, Because their and swings they, in blood sugar correct. is more than, yeah. They're more extreme, mm -hmm. and they may not notice it themselves that they're having problems. Mm -hmm. and they're just sleeping or whatever, and... Um, and if they're really caught up in play, you know, kids get really yeah. focused, they may not realize that they're starting to get a little shaky or that their blood sugar is dropping. Um, or in, in the opposite, that, that it's going up too high, too fast. Mm -hmm. They may get sleepy and just want to lie down and rest. Oh, yeah. And, and not know to go tell an adult that something's going on. Yeah. Do you have other children? I have a stepdaughter, yeah, mm -hmm. she's, um, she's, uh, lives in North Carolina, and she's quite a bit older than Hunter was, she's 17 years older, so she's in her 40s now, she's a uh, retired Navy uh, corpsman, mm -hmm. and doing well. Good. Yeah. But Hunter um, was my only natural child. He was, yeah. Do you have any other, are there any other type 1 patients in your family? No, I was, I was one of one. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually wasn't really, um, 
there's not a huge genetic link in type 1. So the oh, likelihood really? of my son getting type 1 was less than 1 in 100. Really? Yes. But I didn't um, realize that. And I, and I thought, especially since that's what your son had, that I thought that there was a genetic link. Yeah. I'm sure that's a misunderstanding with a lot of people. Correct. So there probably was some genetic link somewhere, but it's not common. Mm -hmm. It's not as common as you might think. Type 2, there are huge genetic links, and you'll see type 2 in families yeah. often. Mm -hmm. um, my type 2 yeah. is because of the medications I'm on. It's not really familial. Um, I don't have other uh, type 2s other than my brother who had an uh, alcohol abuse issue. But um, generally speaking, uh, type 2 runs in families, um, but type 1 doesn't. So you must have been shocked when your son had it. I was, and I knew. I saw the signs, and I knew. I was prepared for it. Um, we had him involved, enrolled in some early clinical trials um, that showed that he had antibodies that indicated he might develop type 1 at some point in the future. So when I began to see symptoms, I knew right away. I told my husband. I noticed it mostly on the weekend, and I said, I'm taking him to the doctor. Mm. And uh, What were the symptoms, the next day. or what are the symptoms? You know, for him, uh, it was unusual development in thirst, uh, in bedwetting, that he hadn't been bedwetting for years. Um, uh, there's a, a odor that goes from the ketones in your body. It's sort of like nail polish, and you can start to smell that on their breath or um, and a little fatigue because they're running out of insulin they're not able to um, to digest the or, or um, process the glucose into their cells so they get fatigue and I noticed that and when I took them into the pediatrician she looked at me and she says you knew and I said yes I did but he was funny. He um, insisted he was only 10 years old and he insisted that he was going to take care of his own shots immediately. So mm. my husband was taught how, I knew how, so I didn't yeah. have to get taught. But Hunter insisted he be taught at age 10 and he gave himself shots from then on. Really? Yes. He, he wasn't did. scared to do that? No. He just embraced it and took it on. That's why he's such a hero. Yeah. You know, he did. Good for him. I think he gets it from you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do you think? You, I mean, yes. you, we talked earlier about how, you know, you, you were still living very independently despite having chronic conditions. And, yes. Um, you know, it sounds like he would have been the same. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It shouldn't be something that controls your life. You work to control it. I, I, yeah, I think he may have developed that attitude for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have any other questions to ask you. Is there anything else that you want to share with me? I think I've, I've said most of what I wanted to say. And um, I hope that my words help somebody to recognize that they should seek help, that somebody should go early to their doctor and get diagnosed so that they don't begin to develop the complications that I've had to go through. And I, I would tell people, don't be afraid to find out because it gives you power. The more knowledge you have, the more power you have. 